Amen. Thank you so much. All right, so it's been three weeks since we met. We've had um, a vacation week, we've had a hurricane week, and, um, and then we have this week. So we're gonna, I'm gonna do, I wasn't really gonna do a recap, but we're gonna, I'm gonna do a little bit, a little bit of a recap since it's been so long since we've been together. But we're in Acts, uh, we're in Acts 2, and we're gonna do verses 37 to 41. So <clears throat> Acts 1, first four verses, Jesus says, wait here, and you'll be baptized by the Holy Spirit. 5 through 11, he says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the utter ends of the earth. That's important. Remember that. We'll need that for later on uh, tonight. Uh, 12 through 14. Um, I'm sorry. Also in 5 through 11, uh, all the, there's this funny scene where all the disciples are looking up, and these two angels or two men dressed in white sort of wander up and go, what are you guys looking at? He's coming back. Don't worry about it. Like he'll, You'll see him when he comes. Um, that's my paraphrase. Uh, then verses 12 to 14, now you've down to the 11, along with Jesus' mom, all the women that were supporting Jesus, Jesus' family, and they're all praying in the upper room. Verses 15 to 17, and then 20 to 26, Matthias is chosen to fulfill um, uh, the scriptures, specifically Psalm 109, 8, uh, to, bring, um, uh, to, to uh, fulfill the scripture to replace um, Judas Iscariot. In the, in the middle of that, though, 18 and 19, you get Judas Iscariot's uh, grisly death. Uh, and then we're on to chapter 2. First four verses, what happens? You have it open in front of you. The Holy Spirit comes, right? Like, it's a big deal. The Holy Spirit comes. In the first four verses, there are tongues of fire, as well as people speaking in tongues. I'm not sure if the Holy Spirit meant a pun there. but um, And the Holy Spirit, uh, they speak in tongues as the Holy Spirit gives them utterance, right? So not, not like some, like, oh, I've heard somebody speaking Chaldean before, so I just, like, spontaneously remembered how to speak it. Or I, I've, I've read some Egyptian before. It's like from the Holy Spirit, completely from the Holy Spirit. These people are able to uh, speak um, the gospel. Then verses 5 through 11, we know that these are um, devout Jews, that it says, and they all hear the gospel in their own language. Verses 12 and 13, some people say this is amazing. Other people say what? They're drunk, right? Uh, verses 14 and 15, let the sermon begin. Peter stands up and he starts, um, he starts preaching. So point one of Peter's sermon, nobody's drunk. It's too early, all right? Uh, uh, and then, but in verse 14, if you look at, in fact, I'd like you to, now I'd like you to look. So look in verse 14, not verse 14. Oh, yeah, chapter, it would help if I looked at the right chapter. Chapter 2, verse 14, he says, uh, at the beginning of his, um, of his uh, sermon, he says what? What's the first three words he says? Men of Judea. Okay, so remember that, men of Judea. And then he takes them through Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. And what somebody's look, you guys are looking at this right now. Why does he take them through that passage? What's some, what is that passage about? Yes, the promise of the Holy Spirit. In the last days, uh, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and then what that looks like. So that's really important that Peter starts the sermon saying um, that the spirit's going to be poured out. Um, in uh, verse 22, we go into the next section. What's the first three words of verse 22? Men of Israel. Um, and so uh, he says, this Jesus, who is attested by God with mighty works and, and wonders in your midst, like you knew him, you saw him and you've killed him and God raised him and now he's in heaven. And um, uh, Psalm 16, 8 through 11 is the passage that he uses then. And, he, and in this passage, he says, he was not abandoned. His body so no, saw no corruption. So that's, that's going to be important here in the next part. Um, and then verses 29 to 36, um, we see, let me see, 29. What's the first word? Brother. So Tim, Tim showed us this when he taught that this um, 
uh, men of Judea, men of Israel, brothers, these were actually like breaks in the, in the sermon. So they were, like, they were like great section headers. So as you're reading, when you see things like that, you can know, oh, all right, there's a little, there's like a section coming here. And then he goes back to men of Judea. Okay, well, that's a section break. Let's see what the next section's about. And then he says brothers. And so that's a section break. And then there's another section coming after that. Just as you're reading to sort of help you see the organization of, of uh, Peter's sermon here. So he says brothers in verse 29. And then he says David died and he's still buried. So why is that? Why did he say that in relation to Psalm 16, the Psalm right before? What does Psalm 16 say about his body? Say it again loud. Won't see any corruption, but David died and is still buried. So what did David's body suffer? Corruption, right? So these Psalms can't be, that Peter's making the case, these Psalms can't be about David. They must be about somebody else. And obviously he's making the case that they're about Jesus. And then, um, um, so David died and he's still buried, but he did foresee Christ's resurrection. Uh, just like in Psalm 16, but also in Psalm 110, when the father says to the son, sit at my right hand and I will make your enemies your footstool. Um, and then uh, verse 36 is the, is the culmination of this section. Uh, and he says, let all the house of Israel. So we had um, men of Israel, men of, men of Judea, brothers, and now we're back to the house of Israel. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. So he's like nailing them, right? And I love when Dylan, when Dylan uh, taught a few, a few weeks back, probably seems like two months ago now, I remember we were talking about him teaching, and I said, what, what are you getting out of this passage? And he just said, I'm just really sensing how Peter's setting up that the the people of, of the Jewish people, the people of Judea that, and Jerusalem that caused Jesus' death, they're in opposition to God. And remember, it says that these were devout Jews. In verse 5, I think it's verse 5, it says they were devout Jews. So if Peter makes the case to them very convincingly that they're actually in opposition to God, what do you think their reaction is going to be? Defensive, heartbroken. Look at verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They're heartbroken. So let's read. We're gonna, so we're going to cover 37 um, to 41. I'm going to read uh, through that, and then we'll look for repeated words or emphasized words or any um, concepts or, or themes that you see there. Um, but the reason I went through all of that is because it all leads to this. Like, you, the, you can't look at this, and you can't really look at any passage out of context, but, the, but everything culminates. Like, Peter, like, it's interesting to me, like, Paul talks about, Paul kind of says, he, he sort of gives you hints that maybe he's not the greatest speaker in the world. And we see some places where Paul speaks, and it, and it sounds pretty good to us now. But he, but he talks about how, you know, I... I'm, I may not be the best speaker, but I live my life the best I could. Like Peter, Peter's a great speaker. Like Peter, Peter is a preacher. Peter is an orator that people listen to. He's a guy that, I mean, here he is, this simple fisherman, and he's quoting Joel and Psalms, and like he knows his stuff, and people are riveted when he, when he preaches this sermon. And so we get to verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation, so those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So take a couple minutes and go through that, those verses and see if you can find repeated words or phrases or any themes.
Give you one more minute. Okay, what what did you find? What's some repeated words? Yeah, very good. You and your. What else? Baptized. Word. That's good. I didn't find that one. Very good. Yeah, very good. So one accord, things in common. Okay, what else? We have Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, and one other God. Very good. So what's that? Yeah, it shows the Trinity, right? Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in verse 38, and then Lord our God is just how the Father is often referred to in verse 39. Anything else? Somebody said something. Give, okay. All right, so who are the players in this passage? There's two, there's two players in this passage. Who are they? Do you, you don't know what I mean. Who are the people in this passage? <laughs> Peter and, and the people, right? So there's Peter and the people. It's actually Peter, if you look carefully, it's actually Peter and the apostles. If you look at verse... Thank you, 37, yeah. Uh, they asked Peter, uh, said to Peter and the rest of the apostles. So they're all there, but obviously Peter's the spokesman. Um, and so you've got, what's the sequence of events then? So the people are cut to the heart and they're begging for, to know what to do. The next, Peter says, this is what you should do. You should repent and be baptized. And then he says, here's what, here's what baptism accomplishes and what, it's, and what happens and who it's for. Then he continues to preach, like, like you don't see many sermons on verse um, 40, right? And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves. Um, because, because we're all focused on the couple verses above that, that, that we're going to spend a fair amount of time on tonight. He continues to preach. He calls out the crooked generation. And then, then 3,000 people respond. That's a good day for a preacher, let me tell you. All right. So any questions about sort of the structure of the passage or anything in there that didn't make sense to you from just sort of a, a general point of view? Everybody kind of knows what happens, right? We know this is the summary. This is the culmination of the sermon. All right. So let's start and uh, back up at verse 37 and let's, let's go through this verse by verse. Now, let me say this. Uh, if if Tim wanted to, he could preach a sermon on each one of these verses, and a couple of these verses he could preach two sermons on, okay? There's just a ton in this passage. So we're, gonna, we're not going to cover everything, but if you feel like something is something that you want to discuss, call it out, except for Josh. Everybody else, call it out, because we'll be here all night long, right? I mean, we'll talk afterwards. Um, no, if you have something that you think is important, call it out, because I guarantee you I'm not, it's impossible probably to hit everything in this passage in the next um, two hours that we have to spend together. So, uh, verse 37. Now, when they heard that this, when they heard, I'm kidding for those of you here for the first time. <laughs> now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? So why were the people cut to the heart? Okay, what did the Holy, should the Holy Spirit convict them? Very good. What did the Holy Spirit convict them of concretely? They crucify Christ. Did they pound the nails into his hands? No. Were all these people in the crowd the day that they were yelling, crucify him? Maybe, maybe not, but not necessarily, right? So, and yet, and yet they still were convinced that they had killed the Messiah. Like, like Peter makes this case, like, um, 
Joel says the Spirit's going to come. You just saw all of us speak in tongues. Guess what, guys? A Spirit has come, just like it says in Joel. And they've got to be like, <gasps> and then he goes, and then he starts telling them about who Jesus was and what David said about Jesus. And they've got to be like, oh, no. And then, he, and then, you know, and then he's like, and then he ends it with, and he's going to make his enemies his footstool. So they're, I'm guessing, and, they're devout, and it says they're devout. I'm guessing they're freaking out. Like, I would be freaking out. Um, that they're like, oh, my goodness. Like, Peter's just made this case. It's like when, you know, uh, like, they're, they're going, like, Peter's like, you're the footstool. And they're thinking, I don't want to be the footstool, <laughs> right? I don't want to be an enemy of God. I'm a devout God follower, and yet I've missed it. And so what do I do? What do I do? So, so you see how Peter made this case, right? I'm not going to, I just kind of went through it again. But Peter makes this really, really well um, sort of step-by-step -step case that a devout Jew would understand. So let me ask you this question. How do you know if someone is really cut to the heart? Have you ever known somebody that was like just in despair about something or unhappy about something? Like, how did you know that they were cut to the heart? They want a solution. Yeah, that's it. I was hoping to get three or four answers before that one. But yeah, uh, yeah, they want a solution. That's, so, so let me ask you this. Like, if you, if, if you or me, if we're like struggling with our sin and we're just like, man, I can't believe I'm struggling with this sin. This sin, this sin stinks. I hate this sin. Dumb sin. Stupid sin. But we never actually want to do anything about it. We just want to be mad at the sin, right? We're not going to take responsibility. We're not cut to the heart. So why do you think it's so important to be cut to the heart? Why do you think it's so, well, like, what's the, what's the key um, outcome of being cut to the heart? Say that again. Change. Where, where did that voice come from? There it is. Ch yeah, ch I thought it was a ventriloquist in the third row. <laughs> yeah, change. You don't change unless you're cut to the heart. And that's what, that's what Peter's going for here, is, is a true change. All right. Any other questions about verse 37? All right. Yeah. Do you think I don't know. I've never thought about that before. Anybody have a thought? <laughs> Tim says no. <laughs> I've never heard the phrase, so. Does that make sense? Oh. <laughs> I, I, uh, it's not. <laughs> there you go. Um, any other questions? Anybody? Good. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah, it, it amazes, you know, one of the things that always, I don't impresses is the right word, but like amazes me is that in the New Testament, for the most part, the apostles only had the Old Testament. And they were converting people with the Old Testament, you know? And what do we do? Well, we pull out our handy little Gospel of John out of our back pocket and, and read, you know, a few verses from John 3. But they were like, I mean, Peter here making this incredible case from the Old Testament prophecies is really amazing and encouraging to us. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, the, the phrase stiff-necked, yeah, stiff-necked comes to mind, yeah. Yeah. Right. Hey, and listen, Peter was a fisherman. Right? He was he wasn't a Pharisee. Paul was a Pharisee. Peter was a fisherman. He was a businessman. A, yeah, he was, yeah, exactly. Like he's a blue-collar guy who just loves the word of God and loved Jesus and spent a lot of time with him. And we see that later on in Acts, that, the, that the, the religious officials were amazed with these guys when they realized that they had just been with Jesus. Like, that was their main qualification. They had been with Jesus. So, like, a little lesson for us there, right? So, um, yeah, also a good lesson for us or a good thought for us, like, you don't have to be, like, uh, the most polished speaker in the world to help somebody find Jesus. You just have to tell them what you know. You just have to tell them what the gospel is and, and however the Holy Spirit leads you to do that. And no matter who you are, young or old, uh, blue collar, white collar, you know, if you're an engineer or a librarian or a student, it doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit can, will, will speak through you and will uh, cut people to the heart. And then they'll want to know, what do I do? All right. So let's look at verse um, 38. And Peter said to them, this is the answer, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right, first thing I want to point out to you is that for repent and be baptized, the, the subjects of those verbs are not the same subject, all right? So repent, the subject of repent is everybody, and the subject of be baptized is each of you. Do you see the difference? So it's a call for repentance from the crowd, but each individual person is called to be baptized. That's going to be important uh, later on as we look at baptism. All right? So let's start with the first thing he says about repentance. So what, what does it mean to repent? Change. What do you change? Your affections. Very good. Yeah, you turn. There's an idea of turning. So changing, changing your affections, turning from one thing to another. Anything else? A change of purpose could be, yeah. Say that again. Singing? Oh, sin. Yeah, absolutely. You're turning from sin? Absolutely. What do you think the, at your, your sort of heart attitude is when you're repenting? Humble. What else? Grateful. Who said that? Who said broken? Yeah, broken. Yeah, you're cut to the heart, right? So you can't repent. I don't think you can repent. Like repent, repentance is not just like an intellectual exercise. Like, oh, I'm, I legally did this thing wrong, and so now I'm going to stop that illegal behavior, and I'm going to start this legal behavior. That's not, that's not the gospel, all right? It's, I caused Christ to be crucified, and I feel sorrow and regret and remorse and brokenness, and I, do, and I, want, I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to do those things. I want to be, I want to be on the good I, w I want to be in right relationship with God, not in broken relationship with God. And so it's like, like, uh, like Mateo said perfectly, it's changing your affections. It's, ch it's, it's changing what you love. It, ultimately, the, the root of repentance is you have to change what you love. Because if you love your own will, if you love your own um, success, if you love your own status, if you love your own reputation, if you love your own accomplishments— then eventually you're going to, you, that's, that's the limit. That's the ceiling of whatever you can accomplish is what those, what those things are that you're worshiping. But when you worship God, you take the ceiling off of that. And so you, and so you need to move on to that, uh, into that mindset. And so it really is changing your heart, changing your affections, being remorseful for the way that you were before, regretful, uh, and, and experiencing a sense of sorrow 
for having acted in a particular way. All right. So, and, and so this is, this is, again, this is this idea of being cut to the heart. When I read this passage, like I just kept coming back to that phrase, being, they were cut to the heart, they were cut to the heart, they were cut to the heart. It's, for me, it's like the, it's the sort of, um, it's the human core of what happens in this passage, the way that God made us to be. All right. And this, this type of changing your mind, by the way, this is not temporary. This is permanent. Anybody think of a Bible verse that talks about how, how we're changed when we come to Christ? Amen. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, you got it, you got it exactly right. Being born, I mean, the whole essence of being born again is like starting over, right? Good. Second Corinthians five seventeen, right? If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away; behold, the new has come. Um, and so there's this um, this this is the heart of repentance. It's not it's not a it's not an adjustment. It's it's a it's a whole change of your heart, a whole change of your focus. All right. Uh, so what what did the people have? I don't know if you're going to get this one. What did the people have in that moment before they were told to repent? Hmm? Guilt. Say that again. A general call. Yeah. So they actually, they actually had, in, in some senses, they had some faith. Otherwise, they wouldn't have asked. Right? But the faith, the faith in and of itself wasn't enough. Why wasn't it enough? Okay. Say more about that. What was their faith set upon? Yeah, very good. So they're putting their trust in their deeds. Like when they said, what should we do? The answer they were probably looking for was like, well, go do this cleansing ritual or go to the temple and do this right or, or whatever. They, they did not probably yet have this mindset of repentance and faith in Christ's atoning work. They, didn't, they, didn't, they weren't there yet. And so that's why Peter has to say, well, you have to repent. First of all, you have to change the affections of your heart, obviously through the power of the Holy Spirit, and then you have to be baptized. Because just believing something without action, without an actual changing of your mind and heart, I mean, Satan believes in Jesus, right? The demons know who Jesus is, but they don't follow him. Jesus never said to the disciples, hey, come believe in me. He said, come follow me. It's harder to follow, right? Because believing is just a head, a head thing, and we're getting into the intricacies or the vagaries of language here. But, but, but true, true, like repentance is, a, is an action word. It's not an intellectual word. And then baptism is an, ap, is an action word. So the word best, I, I'm pretty sure I got this from Sproul, but the word best associated with repentance is the word conversion, because you're converted from one way of thinking, from one way of living, from one way of seeing the world, from one identity, from one master to another. And so without repentance, you can't find salvation. Repentance is the gateway to salvation. And repentance only comes through what? Through the power of God, right? You're not going to repent unless the power of God is there to convict you and, and lead you to that. All right. Um, so now he says, he says, repent and be baptized. I'm really excited to um, dive into this one. Um, 
So baptism is an outward sign of obedience. All right, it's an act that symbolizes the changing of your mind. So it's an outward act that symbolizes an inward or internal change. So I'm going to, um, uh, Mateo, will you look up 1 Peter 3.21? And can I get somebody to look up Acts 22.16? Calvin, thanks for volunteering. And um, Jared, would you look up Romans 6.3? 1 Peter 3.21 and 22, Dylan's favorite, from Dylan's favorite chapter. <laughs> Only three of you remember that. Uh, 21 and 22, go ahead. Good. So baptism, which corresponds to this, the two verses before this are the, are the verses about Noah um, going through the flood. Okay. So he says baptism, which refers, uh, which corresponds to this. So why does baptism correspond to Noah going through the flood? And, you know, the, the ESV study Bible just talks about how the waters symbolize judgment. And so, uh, so the, the judgment that was on the earth in Noah's time was the judgment that wiped everybody out. The judgment that we go through now, we're judged according to Christ's deeds, not our own. And so baptism symbolizes that we come through that judgment, what? Clean. And so the water um, in, this, in this verse, we'll talk, it does other things too, but the water then um, does not remove dirt from the body. That's not the point. It's not an outward, it's not an outward change. It's an appeal to God for a good conscience and not like good like, oh, let me let me have a clean, a clear conscience. It's literally a good conscience. Your conscience is what guides your decision making. So you're asking for a good conscience. That's what baptism is. It's an appeal to God for a good conscience, Peter says. So this also points out, though, that baptism is not salvific, all right? It's a sign of obedience. And this is, this is a really important thing to understand about uh, baptism. It's a sign of obedience and an appeal to God for forgiveness. Uh, Acts, any questions about that? We're going to, let's, let's hit all these and then we'll come back and take questions. Acts 22, 16. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Right, so Paul says, uh, uh, I think it's Paul, uh, says rise and be baptized and what? Wash away your sins. So, so repent and be baptized. Repent, turn away from your sin, turn away, from, you know, change the affections of your heart, and then be baptized. Be washed of the things that you've turned away from, you know, the, of the ramifications of the sin that you've turned away from. All right? So baptism um, um, is a sign of obedience. It's an appeal to a good, for a good conscience. It washes away your sins. And then Romans 6, 3, and 4, Jared? So you can, and this is, this is a little deep, but we're baptized into Christ Jesus. We're baptized into his death. We're buried with him. Hold the symbolism. The baptism is, is, is uh, symbolizing us buried with him in death in order that just as Christ rise from the dead, we rise up out of the water into newness of life. So baptism brings is a sign of obedience. It's an appeal to God for forgiveness. It washes away your sin, and, it, and we're raised up into new life. These are all beautiful symbols of what baptism is about. All right? And we're going we're gonna to come back in the next verse and talk a little bit more about baptism, but I just want you to have that foundation for what baptism is about, what it, you know, um, uh, what it symbolizes, what it's for. And then the last thing he says, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what does Peter mean when he says the gift of the Holy Spirit? What exactly is that? Good, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What, what isn't it? Like what could some people say? Oh, you know what? I think the gift of the Holy Spirit is tongues. What else? Prophecy, healing. That's not what this is talking about. 
He's not saying that you will receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit or special powers from the Holy Spirit. He's saying you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what's he referring back to? He's referring back to earlier in the sermon when he said, and in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Now, will, will, will your, yeah, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. Yeah, all that's happening. But, but the point of this is that everyone is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Um, if you go back to Acts 1.8, at the, or earlier, he says, Jesus says to them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And what, what, is the power of the, what is the Holy Spirit's power give them the ability to do? To be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So the gift of the Holy Spirit is the indwelling of the Spirit in our lives and in our hearts, which gives us the ability to go be witnesses. That's the, that's the first and foremost power that we have, the gift that we have when we're indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And so, brothers and sisters, if you feel a need, a desire, a longing to share your faith, even if you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. It scares me to death, and, and I, I, I don't know what to say, and I don't know how to do Just that desire is, a, um, is the presence of the Holy Spirit in your heart. Because why would you ever want to share Christ if you didn't have the Holy Spirit? Why would you ever want to share about the God of the universe who sent his son down to earth to be executed by the Roman government to, be, to rise out of a tomb three days later, and then 40 days after that to go up into heaven. I mean, if you're going to pick a story to tell people, that's not the story. That's crazy, right? We know that the, the truth of God is folly to those who don't believe. Well, of course it is. In the worldly sense, it sounds crazy. But if you are convicted in your heart of it, even if you have no idea how to share it, that's how you know that you believe that your faith is real, that the Holy Spirit's there. And you just need to grow. You just need to mature. You just need to trust and hang out with people who maybe are a little bit better at it with you than you are. And you'll get there. And, 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 um, but have assurance. Have assurance. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah, sure. 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22, Acts 22, 16, and Romans 6, 3 and 4. And there's, there's tons more, but. <clears throat> All right. So that's the purpose of the gift of the Holy Spirit is to be witnesses. And again, where? Judea. I want, I get, get this. Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. There's a pattern here. We're going to see it in this next verse. Verse 39, For this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. So what's, first of all, what's the promise? He says this promise. What promise is he talking about? Or the promise? Yeah, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the promise. Like, I... I uh, Repent, be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the promise, all right? So, by the way, this is not um, conditional, I don't think. And you jump in here if I'm going off. This is not conditional. It's descriptive. In other words, it's not if you repent and then you are baptized, then you will get the gift of the Holy Spirit because you're in control. You made the decisions, and you did the right things, and it's a reward, the Holy Spirit is not a reward. He's a promise. He's a promise. You'll repent. You'll listen to the call. You'll be converted. You'll, you'll, uh, you'll be baptized as an outward sign of the inward change that's happening in your heart. And you'll get the gift of the Holy Spirit. These things are going to happen for those who are called to follow Christ. All right? So the Holy Spirit is the promise. Um, And then he says, for the promise is what? For you and for your children and for all those who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. Does that rhythm sound familiar? To what? 
Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the utter ends of the earth. This is a pattern that Peter's following very intentionally in his oration. And it, and it, and, and it matters that he's talking this way because of who baptism is for. All right. So here's the big question. What does for you and for your children and for all who are far off mean? And specifically, let's, let's just talk about what does it mean for you and for your children? Right. Right. So it's for you and your descendants, all right, and, um, and for all who are far off. So that would probably be, all, who, do, who do you think that all is? Well, you've got, you've got another phrase. Oh, jeez. Oh, my goodness. Who do you, <laughs> I'm not going to recover from that. Who do you think the all is? Remember who he's talking to. Say that again. No, he's talking, so this is, this is, this is how I would say it. For you, devout Jews, for your children, the children of you, devout Jews, for all who are far off, all the other Jews, and everyone for whom the Lord, whom the Lord God calls to himself. Okay? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the utter ends of the earth. All right? So, now... The promise is for you and for your children, for all who are, all, are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. How do we know when the Lord God calls someone to himself? From this passage, how do we know when God calls someone to himself? What? They're cut to the heart, and because they're cut to the heart, they do what? They repent, and then after they repent, as a sign of obedience, they do what? Right. Have you ever known a baby to repent? I mean, I'm just, this is just a rational argument here. I'm not making like a whole theology. I've never known a baby to repent. And in this passage, Peter says, this is who baptism is for. It's for people that follow this pattern. And so there's nothing in this passage. Now, there are people that use this passage and they say, for you and, your ch and for your children. And they go, oh, well, that means that baptism is for the babies or, the, or all the children to come, no matter what. Um, happens is for all the babies to come, those babies can be baptized. Like you could, there is a, like good people with good theological minds make this argument, okay? This is not like some like pagan heretic that's out there saying crazy stuff. Like there are, there's a lot of people that espouse this um, line of thinking, this rationale. I don't think the passage supports it. And this is the primary passage, that, or this is one of the primary passages they use to support it. I just don't think it fits. I don't think it's, I don't think it makes sense. Exactly. Yeah, very good. So let me give you a couple arguments against that, this conclusion, mostly from a rational perspective. I've already said one, the grammar doesn't support it. The grammar just doesn't support it. He says, repent, all of you, which is a group command. But he says, be baptized, each of you, which is an individual command. So I can't tell somebody to do something that can't understand what I'm telling them to do. That makes no sense. Right? So that's the first thing. Second thing, there's a sequence here. We've talked about this. Repent and be baptized. Baptism and repentance almost always go together. How can a baby repent? But if you want to, even if you want to argue from other passages, the sweet sequence here in this passage is clear. Repent, be baptized, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Have to be, have to have um, um, rational thought to do that. Uh, the third thing is some people will put circumcision and baptism as symbol, as like the same thing. Like baptism just replaced circumcision, but it means the same thing as circumcision means. But here's the problem. Go back to those passages that we looked at. In 1 Peter 3, is circumcision an appeal to God for a good conscience? In Acts 22, 16, does circumcision wash away your sins? In Romans 6, does circumcision raise you into the newness of life? I, I mean, I don't think so. Uh, and then you go to Colossians 2, verse 11. In him, 
also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Okay, so you participated with the pre-crucified um, Christ in that circumcision. But then, verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Well, clearly, verse 12 baptism is about being buried and being raised up again. It's not about circumcision. Cir circumcision was, was about identity. Like, like you, you are part of a people set apart, and this is the sign of you being set apart, is circumcision. It was, frankly, amoral. It was, it was just a sign of obedience, right? There's nothing salvific about it. Baptism is about being buried with Christ and raised again to a new life. I, you just can't say it. The, the symbolism is so much different that I think you have to, that you have to at least from this passage, um, um, stick with, with um, that baptism is for believers. Um, and I've got a fourth one that you can come and talk to me about afterwards, but we don't have time to get into it here. All right, let's talk, let's talk application, all right? Um, how do you, see, let me ask you this, how does this passage point to Christ or what does this passage teach you about Christ? When you look at this passage, what do you see this passage, how does it point to Christ or how does it teach you about Christ? Sure. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Right. Under a new covenant. Yeah. Which is my fourth point, and I'm not going to get into it here, but uh, yeah. I didn't. From this crooked generation. Yeah, I, I mean, um, what I would what I would say, I, I haven't looked at it closely, but I would just say this: that it can't be inconsistent with everything else that he's saying. So I think he's probably saying um, these things will save you. Um, he's also, I mean, I, I wonder what he means. I haven't, I, like I said, I haven't looked into what, like, from this crooked generation means. Tim, you have anything on that, or? Mm. Very good. Very good. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, I think I, I would say this, too. Like, Luke chose that phrase to summarize the rest of Peter's preaching, right? I mean, think about it, right? With many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them. And, like, that's the summary phrase. So the crooked generation is the generation that caused Christ to be crucified also. Tim? Uh, I was going to handle it really briefly, so go for it.
Right. Yeah, and just, to, I think you said this, but just to reiterate it, it's those who received his word were baptized, not those who received his word and all their infant children. You had to actually receive it. You can't receive something that you can't understand. Right. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Tim. Okay, so what do we, how does, how does this passage point us to Christ, or what does it teach us about Christ? This is sort of the culmination of the sermon, so I'll tell you what I came up with. Uh, first of all, Christ is the prophesied one. Like we learned, Christ is the prophesied one. He says that point blank. His death washes away the sins of those who believe, symbolized by baptism, confirmed by honest repentance, and, and, um, and um, with the promise of the of the um, indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Anything else about Jesus that you hear from this passage? Yes. I, I would say it definitely points to the character of Jesus that you are, um, and the and and the purpose and his purpose as a as the as the Son of God come to earth. Right. Right. Very good. Any other comments? All right, how does this passage help you in your relationship with God? I'll tell you how it helps me in my relationship with God. Uh, if, you know, if you're cut to the heart by your own sin, if you realize that you participated in the death of Christ as surely as if you are a Roman soldier hammering in those nails, if you believe in his resurrection from the dead and the e efficacy of Christ's sacrifice and resurrection to pay for your sins, then you know that you will receive the Holy Spirit to help you in this life. And you know that you will receive eternal life with God to the glory of God. Um, so here's my, here's my application, because we're running out of time here. And that is, and this is just for you to think about. You know, what cuts you to the heart? And the second application I have for you is when people ask you, what do I do? You better be ready with an answer. When somebody's cut to the heart and they're looking at you and like, I don't know what to do. Show, you know, invite them to follow Christ. But you need to have an answer. Be, re be ready. All right. So here's my, I have two summaries. One of the passage and, and one that's more of an application summary so my summary is this, a devout group of people realizing that through their action or inaction, they had in some way participated in the death of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, were desperate for forgiveness. Peter showed them the promise of the Holy Spirit prophesied in Joel was for them and those believers who came after them, those who repented and chose to be baptized, and 3,000 were added that day. A long summary. And, uh, and a, a quicker application summary Genuine sorrow for your sins should lead to repentance and obedience. And you can be sure that the Holy Spirit is in you to sanctify you, guide you, and help you proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. This promise is for everyone who repents and believes. You, your kids, and everyone from everywhere. Amen.